you everybody for joining us. Um, today we have a talk from Octavian, who I am honored to say that I've already seen this talk and it's super awesome. So everybody should be very excited. Um, he is currently a postdoc at CSAIL and MIT, working with Tommy Jekyll and Regina Barsley on deep learning for drug discovery. Um, he is part of and contributes to the Machine Learning for Pharmaceutical Discovery and Synthesis Consortium, the Abdul Latif Jamil Clinic for Machine Learning and Health, the DARPA Accelerated Molecular Discovery Program, and the Ellis Society. Um, he got his PhD from ETH Zurich with Thomas Hoffman, um, and we are going to let him take it away. Octavian, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, oh, rules before we go on. Uh, if you have questions at the end, please keep them, put them in the chat. Uh, we will ask your questions directly, and then if you feel the need to follow up, mention it in the chat, and we'll unmute you so you can ask your question or you know discuss. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really honored to be here, and uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to, to attend this talk. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss about how we can combine geometry and deep learning. Uh, to model 3D interactions of molecules, mole small molecules and proteins, and also protein-protein interactions. So let's let's dive in. Actually, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, which are listed here. So this is work work done together with, with them. Um, okay, so, um, so facility structures and interactions of, of molecules represent a key aspect for understanding disease mechanisms and also for designing new drugs or new therapeutics such as antibodies, for instance. So uh, as you might already be familiar with that, ab abnormal protein-protein interactions and protein-protein complexes cause many diseases, for instance, cancer. And you see here one instance of, of like uh, uh, some proteins which are on the surface of uh, like HR, HER proteins, which are on the surface of tumor, tumor cells. And uh, their interaction triggers uh, metastasis and, and tumor spread. So an obvious therapeutics idea is to, uh, to prevent the formation of these complexes by designing uh, some, some, some special molecules. For instance, you see here an example of an antibody, which is going to attach to these two HER proteins and is going to prevent their interaction. So it's going to block, to block their interaction completely. Um, so yeah, so in this talk, I, I, I want to, to give, to give um, a kind of an, an initial solution using deep learning for how we can accelerate this uh, task of predicting complexes of molecules. So predicting, like taking two protein structures as input and predicting how they are going to attach to each other, as well as um, taking a small drug-like molecule as input and the protein target and predicting how they are going to bind and where and in which location. So without assuming anything about binding site or uh, some special parts of the protein being more prone to, to, to binding. Okay, so I'm going to tackle this idea of like wide docking so, or blind docking. So we have no assumption on the binding side. And um, uh, I, 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 I want to argue that one goal is to design not just accurate uh, models uh, for, for predicting molecular interactions, but also very fast models. Um, so I'm going to talk about two papers, which are publicly available, and they have also source code publicly available. One is a spotlight that's going to be presented at a machine learning conference, international conference. The learning representations is going to be in uh, two weeks, actually. Uh, so in 10 days, it's going to be presented there as a spotlight. Um, and this is for protein-protein docking, rigid protein-protein docking. And then the second paper is under submission. Uh, it's probably going to be accepted at some conference. You'll probably hear about it pretty soon. Uh, it's, it's currently on archive uh, preprint. So I'm, go I'm going to highlight both papers today because they offer a, a quite generic solution for, for, protein, for, for molecular interactions. And then I'm going to show results for both protein-protein interactions as well as drug protein, drug target binding. So I'm going to show how we can bind geometry and deep learning to achieve speed ups between tens to hundreds of times compared to uh, existing uh, commercial and open source software, and also often achieving even a better quality. So the pre previous methods are slow and inaccurate because they have to, they are facing a vast space search which is very hard to explore using 
uh, simulations or using uh, things like like Monte Carlo search. Uh, but before I dive into into the problems of existing solutions, I want to argue of of, of this idea of speed. Why do we, why do we need uh, fast models for for docking or for binding? So if we have very fast uh, models, we can use them for virtual screening. So we can scan data sets like zinc, for instance, of uh, hundreds of millions or billions of possible candidate molecules, and then see computationally which of these drug candidates is going to attach to a specific target, let's say a cancer uh, kinase, uh, cancer protein. So, but it's not just that, we can also use, if we have a very fast deep learning model, for binding, we can also use it to predict toxicity. For instance, we can discover side effects of new therapies of new drugs by scanning the entire set of uh, entire human proteome uh, for which we have 3D structures of, of, of proteins available, uh, which, which thanks to AlphaFold, we, we now have way more than, than what we have experimentally derived. Um, so we, we can actually go ahead and scan the human proteome and see if our new drug candidate is going to attach to some off targets, so proteins that we don't want it to attach to, and then maybe uh, takes this into, into uh, wet lab experiments, animal studies and human studies and focus on, this, on specific side effects. Okay, so um, before I dive in, I want to argue uh, about a fact, which is, uh, the 3D conformations and interactions of molecules and molecules and proteins um, are constrained by governing laws of geometry, physics, biology, and chemistry. And uh, previous deep learning models struggle to learn such principles implicitly from data. And um, it, it have one, one, one major reason for why this happens is because we don't have a lot of data. So we usually have a couple of thousand uh, crystal structures or co-crystal structures of complexes derived maybe using X-ray crystallography or other types of techniques. Uh, but this is usually very little amount of data for deep learning models compared to other data modalities such as text or images or uh, time series for other types of applications. So here we have to deal with insufficient data. So we have to be smart in the way we design our models. We have to design our deep learning models in a way that, that's already efficient. It, it cannot just learn from, from a lot of data because you don't have a lot of data. So one desiderata here is to incorporate these uh, priors or let, let's call it like domain knowledge, previous domain knowledge or inductive biases. So we want to incorporate those in principled ways into deep learning models and uh, not just to be data efficient, but also to build trustable solutions that can be trusted by domain experts, uh, like chemistry and biology domain experts. So some, some examples of inductive biases um, that deep learning models should understand, and I will show how I integrate some of them. Uh, so we talk about symmetries, for instance, which is uh, one example. The classic example is that molecules are invariant to rotations and translations. Uh, so if we if we take if we take a protein like you see here and we rotate it, uh, it's essentially the same protein, the same biological object, but a computer is going to see different numerical representations because each atom or each alpha carbon of each residue is going to have a different three D coordinate, so it's going to have a different numerical representation. So we we have to make sure that our deep learning model is perfectly aware of the fact that if we rotate or translate a molecule, it's essentially the same molecule. But on the other hand, this is not true for, for reflections. For instance, if we look into chirality, uh, we don't want reflections, we don't want representations or numerical, yeah, like deep learning models to be invariant to reflections. Uh, we also have the idea of independent symmetries when we talk about multi-body interactions. And that's what I'm going to highlight for protein or for molecular docking today. So a bit later about multi-body symmetries. We also have uh, geometric constraints, uh, which are, uh, for instance, if we, if we want to, to predict how two proteins attach to each other, we know that these protein volumes, as, as kind of, if we view them as point clouds or surf, mesh surfaces, they cannot intersect. And in fact, they should be tangent during binding. So how can we use deep learning to impose such constraints? Um, we also have chemical constraints, we know that Hydrophobic interactions favor certain small surface contacts and cer certain foldings and certain, certain uh, interactions between molecules. 
And uh, last but not least, we also have physical constraints, for instance, various types of intermolecular forces such as van der Waals. So let's now dive into, into um, our solution and see how, so first of all, I'm going to describe uh, the force model, which is called Equidoc. It offers a very fast geometric rigid protein-protein docking. And then I'm going to show later how we can adapt this solution with, with very small modifications to do also drug uh, target binding, where the drug is going to be flexible. So in this case, the proteins are going to be rigid. And in the second case, the drug is going to be flexible, but the protein is still going to remain rigid. So in this talk, just, to, just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody understand, understands it, uh, this. Uh, in this talk, the, the proteins are rigid on the backbone, but we have some, some notion of how, how we can represent side chains. I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay, so the first, the first problem that I'm going to tackle is this idea, of, is this problem of blind rigid protein docking. So we, uh, what it means is that we have two protein structures as input, and we, we take no assumptions about which areas or which parts are more likely to interact. And that's why it's called blind. So what we do is that we want to have our model, which is called Equidoc, is a, it's a deep, deep neural network model, which is going to predict a rigid transformation of one of the proteins, we call it ligands, to place it in the right orientation and the right position with respect to a second protein. So we're going to output a protein complex. So uh, before, I, before I show our solution, I want to highlight challenges of previous docking solutions, such as commercial or open source software. So they're typically very time consuming. So it takes like tens of minutes to hours per each individual input complex. Um, so to predict a single, a single protein complex. And that happens because they are facing this enormous search space of possible ways to attach the two proteins together. So the way these methods work is that uh, they take the two proteins and they try to place them in almost all possible combinations. So they sample millions such candidates like you see here, and they, they have this expensive candidate sampling strategy. Uh, so af after the sample millions of such candidates, they have a way to score them, maybe using some, uh, some energy-based models or maybe using some deep, deep neural networks, deep learning models, as we'll see a bit later. And uh, after, <clears throat> after, after they score them, then there is a second step, which is ranking. So they select the top most promising candidates and these candidates, they are further fine-tuned to fit better in, in their kind of attaching positions. And then the top candidates are returned to, 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 to the user. So you can imagine this, this idea is, uh, this strategy is, is quite expensive. And uh, as far as we know, uh, most of the existing methods are following this strategy. So instead, what we propose here is uh, to bypass this expensive candidate sampling uh, procedure. So we want to do a direct prediction of the protein complex uh, and the consequence is going to be much faster. So it's going to run in just seconds. So let's see how, how we can actually achieve that. So before, before, I, before I show the actual uh, deep learning architecture, I want to say that we incorporate, we need to incorporate some important geometrical constraints. Um, and here, with, with, um, yeah, we talk about, uh, about, about some, some sort of um, inductive biases, which mean we want to be invariant to initial placements, orientations, and roles of the two proteins. So what it means intuitively is that if we take this ligand protein, so this green, green protein, and we place it in different parts of the space, um, of the 3D space, so maybe we, we rotate it also differently, we want to make sure that our deep learning model is going to always predict the same complex, the same final output. And the same is true if we now swap the roles of which one is a ligand and which one is a receptor. So if we now apply our deep learning model to dock uh, the blue protein to, instead of the green protein, we should also guarantee that we predict the same protein complex. And previous methods have typically done this kind of geometrical constraints have incorporated kind of geometrical constraints in a very implicit manner by doing data augmentation. So you take your training data and you just augment it with different initial positions and different orientations of the two proteins and different roles. And you, as a consequence, you increase the training time and also the training data by, by several orders of magnitudes. Maybe you increase it by uh, tens or hundreds of hundreds X. 
um, and uh, so your training uh, time is going to be is going to be much more expensive and uh, is, 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 is going to take much more to train and it's also going to it's not going to generalize to any unseen initial position uh, initial, initial positions but just to those that were sampled by the data augmentation strategy so given these two these two issues uh, in our work we derive a theoretical result which gives necessary and sufficient constraints that Need, need to be hard coded into deep learning models to, for predicting molecular binding or molecular docking. And I'm not going to show what these theoretical results are here. Uh, you can find them in our paper, uh, but I'm going to, to, to describe an architecture that satisfies this constraint. So it all is going to guarantee by design that no matter where you place the two proteins in space initially, uh, you'll by by guarantee uh, you 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 will be guaranteed that that the output of the deep learning model is going to always be the same protein complex, maybe up to superimposition, but always the same protein complex. So let's see how we actually can can achieve it. So our model is called Equidoc from Equivariant Docking. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit later the idea of equivariance for protein docking, but. Uh, just, just keep it in mind that we are going to, to incorporate some, some notion of equivariance. So the intuition is shown here. So we start with true docked complex, which is maybe an, an X-ray crystallography measurement of the 3D structure of the complex, of the protein complex. So we have 3D structures of the two proteins, uh, and we are going to have a notion of coordinates, ligand coordinates and receptor coordinates. Uh, in our case, we are working uh, just with a backbone and we have a notion of side chains implicitly. And we do that because of multiple reasons. Uh, reasons I can, I can detail that a little bit later, computational ones and also uh, empirical uh, quality ones. But in, in this case, you, you, you can just say that each node, so we have, we have N nodes for the blue protein and M nodes for the black protein. And each node represents one residue. Uh, with the coordinates being the coordinates of the alpha carbon of each residue. Okay, so given such a, such a true docked complex, we are going to construct uh, a set of points that lie at the contact between the two proteins. So we call them binding interface points. Uh, so again, these this complexes we have, we, it's, it's our training data. So uh, this, uh, this contact uh, binding interface points are only available at training time. And the way we construct them is taking pairs of residues from the two proteins, which are closer than a threshold. So they are closer in, they are close in 3D in, the, in terms of the distance. So in our case, it's like closer than eight angstrom in terms of their alpha carbons. But there are other ways to, to construct such binding interface points. So once you take um, uh, these this, uh, pairs of uh, residues, uh, which are in contact, uh, then what we do is that we, we take their segments and we take their midpoints. And these midpoints are these red points that you see here. So we call them binding interface points. But as I said, uh, this is just uh, like, like the way this can be constructed uh, can still be done in multiple other ways. We just chose a simple way. Okay, so uh, this set is called here P1 star and P2 star. It's, it's like two identical sets. And wh why do we actually call it like that? It's because when you take these two proteins, so here is the same cartoonish. So we have these two proteins, the blue and, and, and the black protein, which is seen in 3D. Um, so once you take these two proteins and now you separate them out, right? So these two sets, uh, this, this set, which was a single set of binding interface points now become, be, becomes actually two sets. So it becomes P1 for the first protein and P2 for the second protein. And these are like the undocked or unbound input structures. Okay. so. If we do have access to P1 and P2, then um, what we can do to recover the, doc, the, the docked uh, complex is to just superimpose P1 and P2. Uh, so superimposing means you find the rigid transformation. So you find the rotation and the translation to make P1 and P2 identical again. So to, su to superimpose them. Uh, and there are standard algorithms such as CAPTCHA algorithm, which, which do that, so which, which uh, do the superimposition. It, it boils down to do an SVD on some cross covariance metrics between P1 and P2. Okay, so uh, yeah, so essentially what one can do is, is obtain a rotation and a translation from superimposing P1 and P2, and then apply this rotation and translation to one of the proteins, let's say to, to the blue protein. And then it's going to, to recover uh, the initial uh, complex. 
Okay, but uh, unfortunately, P1 and P2 are only available at training time and not at test time or at inference time. So they're not available when we're going to use this kind of tool. So what, what shall we do to, to, to actually solve this? Um, our idea is to have a deep learning model that is going to predict two sets of 3D points. I'm, I'm going to call them key point sets. So they are denoted here by Y1 and Y2. So again, these are sets, sets of points in three dimensions in, in, in the Euclidean space. And the idea is that they should approximate well uh, these binding interface points. So I'm going to train this model such that Y1 matches very well P1 and Y2 matches very well P2. So this is going to be done during training time. And now at test time, I don't have access to P1 and P2. So I, I'm just going to use Y1 and Y2 as proxy sets for P1 and P2. And as a consequence, I'm going to now superimpose Y1 and Y2. There's going to be some errors, of course, uh, because the model is, is maybe not perfect, uh, but usually the predictions are going to be very good. And then we can, we can uh, superimpose Y1 and Y2 and we can use this tr uh, uh, transformation to now dock the two proteins together. Uh, okay, so what I have to show now, which is not here, I have to show you how we predict, what is our deep learning architecture that predicts these key point sets, Y1 and Y2. And then I have to explain how, what, what it means to approximate P1 and P2. So what it means that Y1 matches well P1 and Y2 matches well P2. So these are the two things I have to, exp uh, I have to explain now. And let's start with the first one, which is the architecture. So I'm going to, to show a deep learning model which is shown here in this box. So this is going to be called Equidoc, right? So it's going to be our, our central model. And what this model is doing is taking two proteins as input, two protein structures in arbitrarily orientations and rotations. And it's going to predict some key points. So it's going to predict these two sets. Um, and uh, this is what, what I would need to, to now superimpose um, uh, and, and find the docking transformation, as I said. So let's see how we, uh, how we actually going to, to create this box here in the middle. So before I dive into that, I want to highlight a very important notion, which is the idea of incorporating symmetry, Euclidean symmetry, such as rotations and translations into deep learning models. So you might be, you might be familiar with, with the architecture of convolutional neural networks. This was the first architecture which was incorporating uh, the idea of translation equivariance and there are a lot of follow-up works on generalizing these, not just to translations, but to any types of group, uh, gr group actions. So, uh, you know, symmetries form a, uh, form a group, usually if we talk about translations and rotations. Uh, so it is a mathematical object and you can define this idea of a single object symmetry equivariance, which is actually intuitively shown here on this slide. So if we have an image of a cat, and we apply some convolutional network to, pre to, to do an image segmentation. So to predict the kind of the boundary of this cat, um, then what we want and what the con ConfNet is actually guaranteeing us by design uh, is that if we apply some Euclidean transformation such as we translate the cat in this image, and now we apply the same black box, the same uh, deep learning box, we are going to, to obtain some image segmentation uh, some, some shape as output. And now if we revert this original transformation, so if, if we revert this translation, if we translate back, then we are going to close this diagram. Okay, so this has been generalized also for, not just for images, but also for three-dimensional objects, for instance, for, for molecules, right? So where we want to, to do the same for rotations and, uh, and translations, and also for other types of, of uh, 3D objects or, or multi-dimensional objects which have symmetries. But what, what is here is that you always have a single object on which you act with symmetries. Uh, and what is actually different in our case is that we have multi-object symmetries. So we, we have these two proteins, which now we can act on them with different symmetries. So we can act on them with G1, which can be a rotation and a translation or a composition of rotations and translations. And we can act now with an independent symmetry, which we call it G2, uh, which is going to rotate and translate the second protein. Um, and then we want that if our deep learning box is predicting some key points, we want to guarantee that if, if it's predicting some key points also for, for these transformed uh, proteins as input, then if we revert independently the two symmetries, we want to obtain or 
recover uh, basically closing this diagram. Okay, so you see that it's, it's actually a generalization of single object equivariance, but now it's multi-object equivariance, and it's also independent equivariance in the sense that the two objects can move independently in space with two different transformations. And um, so in, in our paper, we describe this for, um, uh, for two, two symmetries, right? So for two objects, but this is trivially generalizable to any number of objects. Um, so maybe maybe I will take some some questions uh, at the moment. Hey, to... I am happy to, to manage some questions. Uh, Lee Herman is asking, how do you find the subset of residues that interact out of the entire set of residues on both proteins? Perhaps it's known for the target, but may not be known for the ligand. And Lee, if you have any uh, elaborations, let me know and I can unmute you. Yeah, so um, yeah, so in, in our case, as I said, we have access to training data, which consists of complexes of proteins, let's say, or proteins and ligands. And then we can just look in which uh, residues uh, or which atoms from the two molecules are close in 3D space, closer than a threshold that we define. And these are going to be, our, is this going to cons consist our, of our definition of interacting residues? Okay, but of course, more complicated notions of interacting res residues can be imagined, maybe based on the surface of the protein, we just took this very simple strategy to, to define them. But again, this is extendable to different definitions or more complicated definitions of interacting residues. But this is based on knowing the co-crystal structure of the complex. So it is only doable at training time. Lee, is that sufficient for you? I don't hear anything back, I'm gonna take that as a yes. And Grant is asking, is the mechanism of interaction stored in Y1 and Y2 or is that determined after the fact? Yeah, so it, it's actually both, it's actually both. Uh, le let me get into, so Y1 and Y2 are meant to approximate well the binding interface points on one hand, but on the other hand, they're also meant to be good at superimposing, or sorry, are predicting the docking transformation, which means that we are also going to back propagate through the superimposition uh, operation. And I'm going to discuss it in a second. So it's going to be on the next slide. Uh, last question at the midpoint, uh, did you benchmark on some sets of experimentally determined structures? And if yes, what metrics for comparison did you see? Yeah, so later, uh, let, let me show, let me get to experiments later. Okay, so now I'm just describing the model. Yeah, Go so uh, uh, I see that also questions, is the ground truth here, X-ray data? It's uh, basically data sets which contain protein uh, complexes obtained from PDB uh, and for, for small molecules, PDB binds which is yeah, also from PDB. So X-ray crystallography and other types of techniques, uh, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, exactly familiar with, with, the, with the percentage of how many are X-ray crystallography sure. uh, and so on, but, but yeah, it's just, it's just standard public data sets. And I'm going to selfishly butt in with a question because I'm the yeah. host and I can do that. Sure. Um, was there any consideration given to hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity when, when, you're, when you're figuring out your, your interfaces or is it just purely rigid shape complementarity? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, hydrophobicity is only implicitly captured by embeddings. So it's, it's kind of implicitly learned from data, but I, as I argued, uh, this is something that, that can be added and as maybe features. Uh, yeah, we, we, we haven't done that, but this is uh, like ad, ad, adding, adding features, like hydrophobicity features is something that, that can be done very fairly easily. Great, thank you. Um, so if people, if people want to try all sorts of extensions, by the way, our code is publicly available. So feel free to play with it and give us feedback. Uh, I, I'll actually highlight the GitHub links in, uh, later. Okay, so let's, let's continue. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so yeah, so, so the idea here was to integrate uh, this type of uh, independent symmetries and let's see how we actually can achieve that. So we started the two protein structures. And then we are going to design this Equidoc deep learning model, which is going to predict us two key point sets of equal cardinality. It's going to be, it's going to consist of K points in each of them. So in our case, K is a hyperparameter, uh, which is cho chosen. Uh, so basically we, we, we're, we're kind of hyper, hyper search over different values such as 25, 50, 100. So we saw like 50 is, is always uh, somewhat the, uh, the best compared to 25 or 100. Um, so the idea to design this Equidoc model is to stack specially designed layers, integrating the Euclidean symmetries, 
and let's let's see more concretely why i mean by this statement so the way we represent these uh, protein structures is by uh, individual uh, graphs so spatial graphs so we are going to have each node represent one residue in our case the coordinate of it is going to be uh, the coordinate of the corresponding alpha carbon atom is going to have some features attached such as residue type and also features related to a side chain orientation. So we are going to define a local frame for each residue, which is like a local Cartesian coordinate system consisting of uh, basically based on vectors with the adjacent uh, carbon and nitrogen for, for uh, the alpha carbon. Uh, and these, these are called local frame features. And uh, these are going to, to be oriented in three dimensions. So we're, we're going to capture some invariant features. And if you have seen the work, the AlphaFold 2 paper, they also use this, this idea of local frames. So we, we borrow that idea and extend it a little bit here. Um, OK, so these are the nodes of the graph. And now the edges are given by uh, nearest neighbors. So we are going to connect nodes or uh, residues that are close in 3D space. So we are going to connect each node to the 10 closest neighbors in three dimensions. And edges are going to also have features which are not shown on this slide, but features are essentially um, uh, like, like local, like relative orientations of the residues if you want. So each residue orientation is given by this local Cartesian coordinate frame. And then if we have two, uh, two neighboring uh, residues, they have two Cartesian coordinate systems. So we can derive some invariant features. And if you want to know all the details of, about this type of features, please check our Equidoc paper and the Appendix A, which gives us this, uh, which, 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 which describes these features. Okay, so, but, but just the main idea is that we build these k nearest neighbor graphs that for these two specific proteins are shown here. So we have a ligand graph and we have a receptor graph, and then each node has features, uh, has coordinates, 3D coordinates, and also features, and we also have some edge features. Okay, so now uh, let, let me just show these graphs in a cartoonish way because I'm going to, to, to expand this figure a little bit. So we have uh, X, which are coordinates and H, which are, which are features. And then what we do is that we run a generalization of, um, we, we run, we run a message passing neural network. It's actually a generalization of that. It's called graph matching networks. So, you know, message passing neural networks or graph neural networks, they typically work by sending messages in, like inside each graph, so intra messages, which are shown here in, in uh, red, but we also have inter messages. So we have messages between the nodes of the two proteins. And this use some, some attention mechanisms similar to graph attention networks, if uh, people are familiar with that. And on top of that, we actually have this idea of how, how, how we can incorporate symmetries. So this idea of independent SSD equivariance built in into this message uh, passing uh, architecture. So, I'm not describing the exact uh, equations of, of these uh, messages here, just in the interest of time. But what, what, what I want to highlight here is that uh, these message passing uh, layers can be stacked. So we, uh, one can use multiple layers. In fact, in our work, we use five or eight or 11 such layers. And then this is going to jointly transform coordinates, 3D coordinates and features of both proteins so uh, jointly, so yeah, so at, at the same time. Um, and one core property uh, that we uh, that we have here is idea of independent SSD equivariance of coordinates, which means that if we apply some random rotations and translations of the initial coordinates of the two proteins, so maybe we take the first protein, the X1 coordinates, and we rotate by Q1 and translate by G1, and also we apply rotation Q2 and translation G2 to the second protein, then our, like, no, no, no matter how many layers of our, uh, our message passing in our network we stack, we are going to guarantee that the output is going to be uh, uh, deterministically transformed. So the coordinates are going to be deterministically transformed uh, by Q1, Q2, and G1, and G2. Uh, however, the features are going to be invariant. So they are not going to be affected by any transformation of the two input coordinate systems. Okay, so what do we do with this? So once we have these outputs, which are going to be, as, again, transformed coordinates and transformed features, uh, we're going to apply some generalization of multi-head attention layers, which are used in transformer architectures. But now we call them multi-head SS3 equivariant attention layers. 
so they achieve this idea of equivariance that I explained on the previous slide, this independent equivariance. And the way they do it is, is fairly, is, is, is fairly straightforward from, from our, if you are familiar with multi-head attention layers, in the sense that we use uh, keys and queries uh, of, of this attention layer ba uh, based on feature embeddings. And the values are uh, using the transform coordinates. Okay, so this is how we now do some sort of, uh, you, you can actually view it as a sort of projection. So we have two sets of different cardinalities, M and N, and then we are going to project them into coordinates, uh, into coordinate sets of identical cardinality, which is K. K is here the number of multi uh, number of, of heads in, in this attention layer. Okay, so this is our, our deep learning model that predicts from two in individual proteins is going to predict two key point sets in a way that satisfies this idea of independent SEC or rotational translation equivariance. So now what, what I have to explain left, or what is left to explain is how, how we actually match key points to by the interface points, because these sets have different cardinalities and the alignment is not, is not clear. So what we have to do is really um, define this idea of what it means that Y1 and Y2 approximate well P1 and P2. And let's see what kind of constraints we have. So intuitively, what we want is that we want the distance between sets Y2 and P2 is small, and the distance between sets Y1 and P1 is small. Uh, this is just intuition. So formally, uh, what would mean? What would it mean? It, it would actually depend on some alignment between uh, key points, so Y2 and P2, let's say, and also alignment between Y1 and P1. So we have to know, okay, this black star corresponds to which of the red dots, and so on. So we have to we have to we have to to recover this alignment. So. In order to, to predict such alignments, we have several challenges or several constraints. So for instance, we, we know some bijection between P1 and P2 because the way we construct P1 and P2, if you remember, they were initially identical in the complex in the true complex position. So once we separate the two proteins out, uh, P1 and P2 are different sets, but of course we remember, okay, this first point here was corresponding to this first point here and the last point here was corresponding to the last point here. So we, we, we know this, uh, this bijection between P1 and P2 by, const by, by construction. We also know uh, an alignment or bijection be between uh, key points. And that's because key points are generated via this multi-head attention layer. So they have some shared parameters. So they are actually, uh, so, so yeah, so, so they have this, this predetermined um, bijection. Okay. So, uh, the first constraint can be summarized as we want to predict these alignments between key points and binding interface points such that they respect the alignment between key points y1 and y2 and the alignments between p1 and p2 which are known a priori so formally what it means is if we decide that this black star should be aligned to this uh, to this red dot then it should imply automatically the alignment between this blue star and this other red dot okay so uh, but it, it's not just this constraint. We have two more constraints. One constraint is that we want ideally that all key points should cover well all corresponding binding points. So we don't want, for instance, that all black stars are aligned or uh, uh, matched to a single to a single red dot. We want them to uniformly match all all red dots. And also, uh, this matching or alignment should be based on 3D proximity. So this, this black star here should be aligned with one of the closest um, one, one of the closest red dots. So a question is how, how we can actually achieve that. So our solution is to use a very nice mathematical framework, uh, which is called optimal transport. And this, is, this was initially designed for, for aligning or, or quantifying horizontal distances between probability distributions. It can be continuous probability distributions or discrete probability distributions. When we talk about discrete uniform distributions, we talk about distances between, it, it, it actually boils down to distances between sets of points. Um, and uh, what, is mat or what is optimal transport framework is doing is that it's finding two things. It find, it's finding the distance between sets of points in some dimensional metric space. And it also finds jointly their alignment. So their alignment, the alignment of points, which is in this case is shown by this T matrix. This is typically um, a sparse, uh, you, you can view it as a doubly stochastic matrix with um, identical marginals. So- <clears throat> We have a question yeah. in the chat. 
from, I think it was on the previous slide. How are you generating the variance and is it via Monte Carlo? Um, I, I'm not sure what it means by variance. Um, Michael, um, could you please uh, elaborate on what you're asking? I just requested you unmute, Mike. Uh, yeah, it's um, in terms of the the position of the residues. You said it was variant rather than other features. Um, I wondered just how you were getting that variance in your system. Um, I'm I'm not sure what uh, variants are referring to. So, Michael, for is on this slide or is this the previous slide? And uh, the previous slide, yeah. Um, okay, let me go quickly back to that. Um, so, sorry. so here? Yeah, yeah. Oops, sorry, I have a lag on <laughs> my laptop. Okay, so can you can you repeat your question, please? Um, so you're you're saying that you uh, have some variance in the in the positions of your receptor, but not in other features. And I just wondered how you were generating that variance. Uh, I, I I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think you misunderstood me. I didn't. Maybe say maybe yeah. I have a variance. I just said that no matter how we initialize the two proteins in space. Uh, we are going to uh, have this idea of SSV equivariance. We're going to have a deterministic way to predict these key points by architecture design. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I fully understood yeah. your question. We'll, we'll save we can, this one. Yeah, yeah, we'll save this one for later. Okay, Move thank on you. For perfect. Now. perfect, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so quickly going back to, to this slide. So. What I said is that we have to predict these alignments uh, to satisfy these constraints. And the way we do it is via this idea of optimal transport. So what we're going to do is we are going to jointly predict the alignments between key points and binding interface points for both proteins. So we're going to jointly predict how Y2 aligns with P2 for, for this protein and how, how Y1 aligns to P1 for this other protein. So, uh, so essentially to, to, to incorporate this idea, this constraint, the fourth constraint with, with the two bijections, uh, we are going to do this alignment for indices, for indices of, of uh, binding interface points, which are denoted here by, uh, by S, right? So it's, it's for the P points and also for indices of the key points, which are denoted by K. The way we incorporate uh, 3D proximity is by taking these distances in 3D, the square distances and adding them up. So what we want in the end is we build this cost matrix, which says, what is the cost of aligning um, key point index K to binding interface index S for both of the sets, of, of the pairs of sets. So we're, we're going to build this cost matrix and um, this optimal transport framework is going to find us a T matrix, which is a sparse, uh, non-negative matrix with equal margin, equal row and column marginals, which are going to tell us um, essentially how we uniform, how, how we spread uh, exactly all key points to all binding interface points. So if if you do, if you're not familiar with the optimal transport framework, maybe it, it makes a little bit sense to look at some tutorials on, online to understand more the mathematical um, uh, idea behind behind this. But but just intuitively, this T matrix is giving a generalization of bijection between sets of different cardinalities. So if, if you have two sets of equal cardinalities and a bijection between them it can be viewed as, a, as a, or can be encoded with a permutation matrix. Uh, if, if the two sets have different cardinalities, then you can encode it with a sparse non-negative matrix with some equal, um, like, like a doubly stochastic matrix if you want. Um, so this is actually what, what this T is doing. So T, T is recovering a sparse alignment between, between these two sets. And um, uh, so, uh, this, so, so, so th th there is a very nice uh, open source framework which allows one uh, to compute this minimization uh, very fast. And this can be integrated end to end with a deep learning architecture. So in our case, C is going to be to, to, have, uh, uh, to have deep learning network outputs. So it's, we're going to back propagate through this C, C cost matrix. 
So we, we are, go, we are go, first going to compute this T during the forward pass and during the backward pass, we're going to update all the parameters that are in just in C and we're, we're going to, to keep T fixed. Okay, so this optimal transport, uh, this is going to give us a uh, loss term, which is going to just say, please take the key points and make them match the binding interface points, these red points as good as possible and do it, do it jointly for the two proteins. Okay, so this, this optimal transport loss function is now shown here. Uh, and, and that's how we match the two uh, key point sets. But as, I, as, as one of the questions asked before is that it's, it's not just this part of the model, but we also have a second uh, part of the model, which is we superimpose by one and by two. So these two key point sets. And uh, we, we find the rotation and translation. So we find the rigid transformation to superimpose them. And we're going to do that to dock the two proteins together. So we, we can do that by using a CAPTCHA algorithm. And so we, we can make it differentiable. So in the end, we're, we're going to back propagate through this arrow that, that's shown here. And we can do that because this CAPTCHA algorithm is essentially just an SVD on a particular matrix, on a three by three matrix. And we, we can make it differentiable because existing deep learning frameworks have, have done that. We have another okay, question so, in the chat. Yeah. Is there a limit to the difference in the cardinalities at the key points that the systems begin to not really work? That's from uh, Tony and Arab Arbenides. Yeah, so we, we have tried, so, so first of all, what we have done is that we, we have looked at these protein, true, true protein complexes and quantify what is typically the number, what is kind of a range of the number of interfaces, binding interface points of these red points. And we see something between tens and, and a few hundreds, like 200 usually, uh, we, in rare cases, more than 200. Uh, so what we have tried was uh, 20, 25 key points, 50 and 100 in our experiments. Uh, of course, uh, for 100, uh, the runtime, it st starts to increase a little bit more, the, the training time. So there is a trade-off. And also we haven't seen a clear difference between 50 and 100. So 50 was slightly better in our experiments. So we, we just remained with 50 as a hyperparameter. So yeah, so short answer is that we haven't tried more than 100, but we haven't seen a benefit of doing that. Okay, so, um, yep, I guess that's it. That's it. Okay, so, uh, so I, I didn't explain how we actually, why do we actually backpropagate through this SVD here? Uh, and that's because once we predict this uh, final complex, then we actually know the true complex, right? A training time. So we can build just a uh, mean squared error like between, let's say the legal structure uh, while keeping the receptor structure fixed. Or we can do like complex, full complex structure, right? So we, we, we have this uh, MAC loss here, which is which predicts the error of placing the ligand. So you see here, like these key points have two roles. So one role is to, to make them match well uh, the binding interface points. And the second role is to make them predict well the final complex. Uh, so if, even if there are errors in the key points uh, in predicting the, the binding interface points, these errors can still be in the end, um, mitigated by, by having a good key points that, that predict well uh, the final complex structure. And we, we have done ablations in, in our paper and we have seen that we actually need to incorporate both these loss functions. Uh, and finally, we also have an auxiliary non-intersection loss. So in, in a few cases, we see that there are some intersections between proteins, like, like as really point clouds or steady clashes intersections. So um, uh, we, we find it useful to incorporate non-intersections uh, loss. And, um, how, how that works is that we have to do it very efficiently. So typically one can do that by computing the surface of a protein, maybe using some, with some expensive tool like MSMS software, and then having an intersection loss between meshes of 3D objects. But we find the solution to be very slow in practice uh, for, for training, I mean, for, for, for uh, like during training time. And then instead we devise some very efficient point cloud intersection loss. So the intuitive idea is that we should give a very large penalty if the two bodies intersect, like, like you see here on the left, and the low penalty if the two bodies are non-intersecting or tangent. So the way we do it is that we build a surface of a point cloud. So we really view it as a, you have two point clouds in three dimensions and you want to see if they intersect and how much they intersect. And whenever they intersect, you want to put a penalty and back propagate to that penalty to, to make them like uh, become non-intersecting. Okay, so um, the way we do it is that um, we, we, we inspire from this idea of how uh, like existing software uh, shows the surface of a protein, right? It's basically a mixture of Gaussians which are centered 
around each atom in the in the protein or each residue in our case right we have this xi which represents each alpha carbon of each residue so it's it's it's, it's essentially a mixture of gaussians which is shown here so it takes this function and this describes the surface of a point cloud and why it does it it does it because if you take all points x in three dimensions for which this g of x has a particular value gamma then this is going to describe it's going to to actually draw uh, this uh, the surfaces that, that you see here drawn uh, and then the interior of a protein can be seen as just all sets of points x for which g of x is smaller than gamma and the exterior can be all sets of points x for which g of x is bigger than gamma so again again you, you, you have to choose gamma carefully here but you can do it uh, and now the intersection loss is just saying okay we are going to take each each um, each point from one point cloud and we're going to check against the intersection with the second point cloud and vice versa so if these intersections are violated um, uh, then we, we are going to so, sorry if the non-intersections are violated so if we have intersections we are going to, to put a penalty so we are going to write this max margin loss function so in the end you see it's it's it's, it's a very efficient way to, to do a non-intersection loss and we can back propagate very easily to three okay so I, I finished explaining how we do protein protein docking in a rigid fashion. And now I, I want to show very quickly before I dive into experiments, uh, how we actually do it for, for flexible drug-like molecules. So again, we have a rigid structure for, for, the, for the protein. Um, and then we have a ligand, which is as input, we take a ligand graph. So a small drug-like molecule uh, graph. And then we feed in some initial random conformer, maybe from RD kit or other type of, or Omega or other type of software that gives us some low energy conformers independent of the protein. So uh, we are going to, to, to have our model, which is called Equibind, which is going to predict, uh, is going to do blind docking. So it's going to predict wh where is the binding site, how exactly the ligand is going to be attached. So the orientation of the ligand and also um, also the, 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 the flexibility in the, in the 3D structure. So it's, it's going to take this initial conformer and, and rotate the torsion angles of rotatable bonds such that the ligand fits well in, into, into the pocket. Okay, so again, it's, it's blind docking. So we don't have any assumption of the active site. So the architecture is very similar to what I showed before. Instead, now one of the inputs is actually the ligand are the kit conformer. So we are going to build a K nearest neighbor, a spatial graph on top of uh, on top of the ligand. So now coordinates are given by atoms instead of residues, but the protein is actually represented exactly like before. So residues and corresponding features and coordinates. So we are going to run the same architecture is going to transform coordinates jointly for the ligand and for the receptor. And we're, we're going to predict this rigid transformation to dock, uh, to, to dock this ligand to, to, to this receptor. But what is different now, in order to model flexibility of the ligand, we actually take this point cloud and we say, oh, we actually want that the, these transform coordinates represent also how um, represent also how the the the, the un, unbound structure changes to the bound structure of the ligand. So we are, we are going to have an additional loss function that's called the Kapsch RMSD loss function. So it's going to take this point cloud and it's going to say, I want this point cloud of transformed ligand coordinates to represent uh, after superimposition. Uh, 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 to, to, to represent the bound coordinates of the ligand. So to represent the, um, the docking transformation. Um, uh, so the, 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 the bound transformation. Okay, so the way we do it is that we actually train these coordinates to represent, um, again, after superimposition to represent the coordinates of, of the bound ligand. So together now with this, with this pipeline, which predicts us the active site and the docking, the rigid docking transformation, we now have everything that can do flexible uh, ligand uh, binding to rigid proteins. Okay, so um, in practice, this point cloud can be fairly deformed. So it can fairly deform local structures and rings. So then what we find very useful is to guarantee that we have biologically plausible deformations from unbound to outbound states of the ligand we actually apply a, a post-processing step, step, which is going to take the initial ligand conformation and change only torsion angles of rotatable bonds, such that it's going to fit well this Z point cloud, which is the transformed point cloud. Um, and we can do that very fast by using a special uh, for Mises low likelihood dis uh, distribution, which I haven't shown here. It's in our paper if you're interested in, in the details. Okay, so that's how we do flexible drug binding to 
uh, rigid receptors. And yeah, so I, I actually explained before that if we if we don't do this post-processing step, then we have fairly large deformations. But after post-processing, we can actually fit. Uh, we, we can actually only change uh, torsion angles of rotatable bonds, so fit ligands well to to, to the corresponding transform coordinates. Okay, so let me let me dive into experiments now, and then I'll take your questions. Um, so now le let's look first at, at experiment um, for drug for flexible drug ligand binding. To so, but before ligand. you go on to the experiments, um, yeah. I think it's important to have a high level overview of what's going on. So there was one question from Jihan, which is uh, it goes back to the original algorithm, but are the cardinalities y one and y two the same? Yeah, all is the same. A hyperparameter, which I said in our case is like right. the best one is fifty. So is a simplified way of looking at what the architecture is doing is that the deep neural net is trying to identify probable probabilistic key points that you then do SVD on, which is more time consuming. Yeah, so you cannot do SVD if, if the two sets are not identical in cardinality. So you cannot, do, uh, let me just quickly go back to this slide. You cannot do this step here, the superimposition, unless the two sets are aligned. And also equal of equal cardinality. Yes. So uh, and also we don't know the number of binding interface points, right? This is yep. going to be variable. So we we, we don't know that. Uh, and in our case, we assume all is like we generate a fixed number of points, and this fixed number of points they, they should actually cover very well the entire binding uh, binding set. But is it uh, fair to assume that you don't want to do a lot of SPDs? Yeah, so in, in our cases, do we do a single SVD? It's okay, just, so the, the point of the, thing. right, so the point of the neural net is to get you the best orientation optimization that you do the SVD on. Yeah, SVD, SVD during training is fairly, or in our, it's actually hard coded in our model, right? So SVD is, is part of an operator, is, 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 is actually a layer in our deep learning model, right? So this, this arrow here is one, one layer which you back propagate through. You don't want to do that too often because it's, uh, one, it's ex it's kind of expensive, and second, it's we haven't found a good way to parallelize it over multiple, uh, like to do mini batches. So usually you have to you have to take your your graph batching uh, input and just um, unbatch it, kind of. So take each graph individually and uh, iterate over it and do this SVD. So it's it, it's fairly expensive. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, since we are a bit late on time, let me just get to some, some experiments, which I'm actually very excited about. Um, so let's look first into drugs binding to molecules, so to proteins. Uh, so we look into PDB bind, which is uh, arguably the largest data set of, uh, of uh, experimental, experimentally derived co-crystal structures of small molecules attaching to, to proteins. It, it consists of around 19K complexes. And typically people have used a traditional test set, which is called CASF 2016. So this has been uh, very much uh, used in most of the papers over the past five years. But what we have seen is that we have seen that some of the deep learning models are overfitted to that. So then we said, okay, let's maybe try to, 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 to have a more realistic view of how bad overfitting really is. So let's, let's now, Take a new test set. Let's take a test set which contains a recently released structures from this PDB bind data set. So we just take version 2020, uh, which is the latest uh, version as being the test set. And everything before 2019 consists of training set. But we, we did this traditional step where we, we make sure that there is no shared ligands, no shared drug-like molecules between train and test. So we also remove that. But, but there can be shared proteins. And I'm going to show results also when we remove completely the shared proteins. We argue that keeping shared proteins makes sense because many times you know what is your target. You just want to drag something to it, right? Um, okay, so instead of, baseline, instead of baselines, we used the most commonly used uh, open source baselines, which are arguably Autodoc Vina and Smina. Uh, they, they rely on this heavy, expensive uh, sampling strategy of, of putting the two molecules in all possible positions and then scoring. And on top of MINA, uh, there is a deep learning model which is just applying it for scoring functions. So it's called CNINA. It's a very recent model. So it, it uses deep learning to, to do scoring of candidates. And then you also, also use Glide as a, one, of, one, one of our commercial baselines. So it's developed by Schrodinger. 
Okay, so um, so our model, yeah, is called Equibind, and and uh, first of all, I'm going to show the baselines. So we have runtime over a 16 core machine, and also over GPU. Whenever we can, we can run it on GPU for 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 the deep learning models, and then we use ligand RMSD. So how far is our predicting a predicted RMSD, a predicted ligand uh, structure to the true ligand structure when the receptor is fixed. Um, and we show percentiles of the ligand RMSD over our test set. Um, and um, here we also show the percentage of molecules predicted to be less than five angstrom for the, from the true uh, ligand structure and less than two angstrom from the true ligand structure. And you see here the corresponding plots for, for these baselines. Okay, so now we take our model. It's called uh, yeah, it's it's equibind called equibind. And you see, it's much much faster, between hundreds and even thousands of times faster compared to existing models, um, also on GPU. And here we also, by the way, we remove pre-processing, which is uh, which was actually very heavy for Glide, for instance. So these models don't contain the pre-processing, which can be done a priori. Okay, so you see that we are fairly good in most of the metrics. Um, oftentimes our performance, the baselines, like at a, a really a, a tiny fraction of the cost. But uh, what, um, like, like one, like this two angstrom uh, percentage metric, we are, we are still fairly behind the baseline. So this is shown here. So what we have done then is we take the predictions of Equibind and now we just fine tune them with QVINA. So we have Q and Q2 is just Q vinyl with different uh, local search exhaustiveness. Um, so you see here is much faster than existing Q vinyl because you can run it just 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 to do fine tuning of predictions of Equibind, and we, we can also run Smina. So it's shown here in S. So you see here now that we outperform all baselines on all metrics, but of course we increase the runtime. So there's going to be a trade-off between runtime and quality ultimately. So it depends on 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 what applications people care about. Okay, so these are our quantitative results, and then I'm going to show one, one, um, just one visualization that I'm actually very excited about. So when we when we had this um, this model out, we 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 uh, took it to we, we gave it to our our partners at, at Relay Therapeutics, um, and they actually were very excited to try it on one specific uh, tyrosine kinase, uh, this six uh, HD six uh, complex. Um, so basically, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a kinase uh, responsible for three types of cancer, um, and uh, there are just three drugs that can bind to this um, to this protein in PDB bind. So we made sure to remove the drugs from the train set, and then also the protein from the train set. So what you see here is really protein and drugs are just a test time that we see. So this is just this is just test time, and uh, two of the drugs are shown here. So we have this ABL001, and we also have which was FDA approved just last year. And we also have these other other drugs, uh, other drug, um, which uh, both of them were developed by Novartis. And then you see you see here the ground truth co-crystal structures. So what we do is that we take we take these uh, two drugs out and we try to predict where they are going to, to bind in this uh, protein, assuming that the protein is rigid again. So if we use this deep learning baseline, Knina, uh, it's going to predict both in the same pocket, uh, which is which is basically um, like missing completely one of the pockets. If we use Mina, it's going to use, it's going to find this other pocket, but it's going to miss this first pocket completely. If we use Glide, um, we are going to, it's going to find the two pockets, but it's going to, by summary, uh, I, I don't know, for some reason, it's going to swap the two locations. And uh, finally, if we take our model, find it with Mina, then you see that it, it's actually find, it, it not just finds, finds very well the two pockets, but also, the predictions are fairly, fairly good, fairly accurate. Um, okay, so I, I have more, more experiments to show here. So uh, I, you, you remember that I said that for small drug-like molecules, we fit some initial random conformer, which is in our case a random RD kit conformer for the small molecules. So uh, we actually uh, tried uh, to see how how much variance does this that uh, is, is this uh, random procedure. Uh, getting uh, in our model, and uh, you see here that it's it's fairly it's it's fairly um, it's it's fairly okay. So it's between zero one, usually around zero point five. Um, we also we also try to understand a little bit better what happens, like how in how many of these cases, uh, like if there is a, a correlation between molecules that are very similar to 
train molecules, so test molecules being very similar to train molecules, if, if, if this kind of correlation can be also seen between similarity, be, between similarity between train and test molecules and also the actual error, so it's the actual ligand RMSD, right? So uh, maybe one could say, oh, if you overfit to the train set, then maybe your test molecules, which are very similar to the train molecules, are going to encounter a smaller error because there is some overfitting. But you can actually see here in this plot that uh, it turns out that this is not true. And in fact, there is almost no correlation between, again, similarity between test and train molecules uh, and, and the ligand RMSD of, of, of this test uh, ligand. Okay, and um, I also promised to show what happens if we completely remove the receptors from the, from the test set. So again, in, in the previous results, there is some receptors can be uh, common between train and, and test, but, lig but not, not ligands. So ligands are always different between train and test. So if we completely remove our receptors from the, train, from the test set that are also in the train set, then you see here that we are still doing fairly well on, on most of the metrics, but we, we, we do have some, some, some uh, some error uh, increase, especially in the two angstrom region. Again, all these results are also available in our paper. So finally, le le let me- We, we have one, one question from Byron, which is, did you try using data sets with decoy molecules? No, uh, yeah, so this is a great question. So far, we just assume that uh, the input consists of a drug and a protein, and we are just going to make the drug bind to the protein also. The, the model is going to try to predict a drug binding to some specific protein. It's not going to have a, a notion of uh, decoys or negative examples like first saying, okay, this drug is not binding at all to this protein. We, are, we don't have that yet, but we are working on having that as an extension of our model. So essentially uh, what, what we are currently trying is we take predictions of equibind of our model and see if the predictions are, are like, like, like train an additional deep learning model to predict if this complex, if this predicted complex makes sense or not. If it doesn't make sense, then we are, we are, we are just going to output, okay, this drug is not binding to this protein. But no, uh, it's a great question and we haven't, uh, we, ha we haven't done that so far. Um, yep, okay. So finally, let, let me just quickly show some experiments for rigid protein, protein docking. Um, so here we use a big data set from PDB, which is called DIPS. And also a standard, so this contains like roughly 42K pairs of proteins. Uh, it, it only contains their bound structure. So it, it only contains complexes. So we don't have access to unbound uh, protein structures. And that's why we, we can only do rigid protein docking on this big data set. We have also this uh, um, docking benchmark data set, which has been for a while like the, the most uh, widely used um, a docking benchmark for protein protein docking, but it is fairly fairly small, and we can only do some fine tuning on on a part of it. So we don't do, yeah, and yeah, we, we 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 do a little bit of sorry, we do a little bit of fine tuning training on a part of it, and we keep a part of it for testing and validation, of course. So we have a number of baselines, uh, academic and and commercial, like Clasp for for instance, HDoc, PatchDoc, and Attract. And first of all, let me just show you the runtime. So uh, uh, so, so two of these models, Attract and HDoc, we could run locally by downloading the, their binaries, but two of them, we have to submit test examples one by one or on their web servers because we could not run them locally or, or they didn't have any local solution. And um, so, of course, when you submit uh, one by one, then these runtimes are a bit pessimistic. So in practice, they are more likely to be all kind of on the same, on the same uh, parity with Attract and HDoc. So Equidoc is much faster because it doesn't rely on the same sampling strategy. And in terms of quality, we measure two things. We measure complex RMSD and interface RMSD. Uh, again, this is like rigid protein docking. And um, yeah, you see here that uh, we usually outperform three, three out of four baselines uh, with the exception of HDoc. Now, uh, one problem with all these baselines is that we, can, we cannot train them on our train validation test split because they don't have open source code. And so we cannot do that. So we, we just took their, their kind of pre-trained or, or their existing models and we just run them on our test set. And what happens actually for HDoc, for instance, which is a template-based uh, modeling uh, method, is that actually on half of the complexes, you can see that a, a bit here, half of the complexes are of, the test, of our test complexes are predicted like with zero point something RMSD. So really, really 
very very accurate and how far how far worse or comparable to attract and others and and uh, to us so in this case it's it's, it's a question yeah is this uh, hdoc using templates from our tests or not so this is like a question that we don't know how to address properly ideally we want to to make sure that uh, none of these baselines have used any information from our test set. Uh, we, we are trying now to also do some sort of time-based splits. Uh, we don't have results yet, but we, 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 are, we are going on, on that avenue. Okay, so, so oh, just one, one visualization and I'm going to finish. So this is one ground truth uh, structure. We are going to, to dock this white protein now shown in blue. These are the baselines. They, they fail to find even the right side of the black protein. Our model is finding the correct side, but it's still, it's still not perfect. So, so there is room for, for improvement. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to go over this paper, uh, but I just want to advertise it. If people are interested in our work also for predicting 3D uh, conformal ensembles of small molecules, we have a paper publi published in NeurIP. So this is doing what RDKit or Omega are doing for predicting uh, small molecule conformations, but uh, also very, very fast. Uh, our code is publicly available, so yeah, feel free to try it and give us feedback. Uh, and I want to thank my collaborators and uh, partners and sponsors here at MIT. Um, and with that, I yeah, thank you, thank you so much for, and I'm I'm happy to take your, your questions. All right, so thank you so much for talking. And you know, a personal observation is that for people viewing this talk, there's a lot of math in here. Don't be scared by it. If you don't understand it, you can learn it. Um, I think yeah, it's, it's important to understand what equivariant means in terms of modeling because it has a couple different meanings. So understanding what these mean will help you understand these talks a lot better. So we have a question from Rochelle. Uh, so is there a bias in performance of your method since there is a bias in your training sets? For example, if you try membrane proteins or other types of proteins that are less representative, expect this to see a, a difference yeah this is a it's a, it's a per perfectly valid and, and actually great question we haven't uh, looked into specific uh, families of protein so um, yeah so uh, what i want to say is that for protein protein docking we do split based on families so this deep data set gives gives uh, family family codes for proteins so we do we do the train validation test split based on families so in that sense uh, we argue that it generalizes across different families but we haven't specifically try to look into specific classes of proteins. So I, I guess we, we, yes, so, so far we haven't, we haven't done that, but yeah, it's, it's some investigation that we need to do. I, I totally agree. Um, so Toby is asking how challenging did you find it to train junior architecture? Yeah, so um, one, one, uh, one problem is um, this SVD operation, I, I think I mentioned that before, it actually slows down a little bit uh, the training. So the GPU uh, usage cannot be higher than 50%, actually many times it's like 20%. There's still an issue that we are trying to, to improve. Um, so yeah, so one problem is that backpropagating through SVD requires, and especially if you use message passing neural networks, it requires that you, you do an unbatching operation. So you iterate over examples in a batch instead of, in, in a mini batch, instead of just processing everything in parallel. So that's one bottleneck. The second bottleneck is on a, on a GPU memory bottleneck. So so far we have used only residue. Uh, so each, each node in our graph is actually, it's actually a, a residue. Um, a, an, a, so each node corresponds to alpha carbon of a residue. So, and features of a residue. And we have also tried to have really each node corresponding to each atom of the protein. But it turns out that that's way more, way more computationally heavy. It consumes a lot of GPU memory. You cannot use batch size bigger than one, even on a 40 gigabyte, uh, RAM, GPU RAM, which is already a lot. <laughs> um, so in, in practice, if we use just residues, we can do mini batch of 10. So we can have our, of our training time to take around four or five days. Uh, if, if you go, sorry, I need to, yeah. If you, if you, yeah, if, if you want to do all atoms, it's going to be way more expensive. It's going to take more time. And so far we haven't seen any empirical improvements. In, in both of these setups, protein, protein, and protein ligand. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to, to, to say regarding to, to, uh, to, to the point of, of math and st stuff like that. So I, I think the, if, 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 if people have any questions, feel free to reach out to me over email, and I, I'll be happy to suggest some readings. 
there are a lot of tutorials on AP variants and a lot of interesting papers out there. Uh, but yeah, sometimes there is a little bit of, of math uh, and some of the models might not be computationally very, very attractive. <laughs> Uh, in, in our case, we use actually a paper which is called, uh, we, we extend the paper which is called EN Equivariant Graph Neural Letters, which offers a very, very efficient, computationally efficient way to do, to build in equivariance to message passing neural networks. So the overhead is really minimal. It's almost like nothing. But there are other papers like tensor field networks, which use spherical harmonics, which actually increase, increase computation time and memory quite, quite badly. And if you want to scale this to proteins and stuff like that, it, it's just it's just almost impossible, I would say. Uh, so I'm going to allow one last question um, from Lee. Uh, actually, two. So how challenging was it to actually train the architecture? Yeah, I, I just replied to that. Uh, okay, great. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't hear the intro question there. Um, so I guess the interesting question is for a, a novel system, you don't know where the receptor is. So what are the odds of finding it? I'm paraphrasing what Lee wrote. You don't know you don't know the receptor structure. Well, you don't know where the receptor is. Where? Where it is? So you have a protein that you haven't seen before, you don't know what family it is, you don't know what class it is, and you're trying to figure out where you're going to be docking to. There are things like pocket finders and things like that that you can run on it. Um, yeah. there's also dynamics to find cryptic pockets, but given something that you haven't seen before, what are the conditions that you require to be able to find the receptor? So Actually, that's that's not my question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Brian, that's not my question. My question is, all right, let's assume you know on the on the target, either experimentally or by crystal structure, you know where something is going to bind to or where the likely binding region is. But when you're testing out, you're testing, you know, uh, a bunch of other proteins, you don't know how. The, the other protein is going to bind to it. You don't know the region. The orientation is at the back of the protein, the front. You know. How do you how do you find that? Or is that what the or is that what the neural net is doing? Is that what the model is doing? It's finding the optimal set of points on the test protein that are going to bind to the target. Is yeah, that so, a, so? So this model is it doesn't assume any information about uh, which areas of the surface of the protein are more likely to interact. So it's completely blind docking, but if you, but so it's, it's, it's going to it's going to find the interface, the binding interface, by by this idea of predicting key points which approximate uh, this contact between between proteins, right? Right, but the key points are going to be a subset of the key points on the test protein, right? Because no, because you're going to find you're going to find test points all around that test protein, not the target, not what you're binding to, but what you're what the you know, not, not your starting protein, but what you're throwing against it. You don't know where on that protein, where where on that protein is likely to bind to the binding pot, right? Yeah, exactly. And we don't assume anything. You, you just feed in two molecules, a protein and a small molecule, or a protein and a protein. And there is no information, like which parts are more likely to interact. This model is going to do some joint embedding of both proteins or both molecules at the same time. And it's going to find implicitly, uh, sorry, explicitly actually, where like also the okay, interface. So, all right, so part of the model is finding the subset of, or the region out of many possible regions. Exactly. Yeah, okay. But, but okay. it's not, but, what is, but, but the core difference from previous work is that we don't search over all possible attachments. We are doing one shot, uh, like direct shot finding. Yeah, you're not, well, you are searching, you're just doing it in a more direct way. Exactly, so it, it's not like we have to enumerate all possible yeah, millions right, of right, way to attach right. and then score and see, okay, this one is more likely, this one is less likely, so let's discard it because it's super expensive, right, computationally. Yeah, so yeah. our goal is really to make something very fast that can be maybe some good initial solution for more accurate, uh, molecular dynamics, uh, but but much slower uh, models, right? Like we show here with fine tuning with MINA and so on, which improves results. Um, so yeah, so, uh, but also um, something that we, 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 I currently don't show here, we are also investigating that is uh, wh whenever you have information, maybe, maybe, maybe you have some models which, which just takes the two sequences of the proteins as the input, 
and compute some some likelihood of, of, of their interface, right? Just based on sequences, not not on 3D structures. There are some deep learning models to do that. And if you, if you do have some, or or if or if you have some additional knowledge of what areas of the surface are likely to interact, uh, we are actually actually investigating ways to have additional loss functions to add to to help the model to help this pocket point prediction to leverage such 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 extra information. So information regarding to to like um, binding to, to which areas are more likely to bind. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the clarification, Lee. Thank you. So with that, I will say thank you, Octavian. Um, this is very clever. I'm really as interested to see how it progresses. We have plans for it. Um, but that being said, uh, everyone give thanks. We're glad to have them back. Uh, we'll try to do a couple more before the summer. And then I will say goodbye to you all. And thanks for coming. Thank you so much for the invitation. Bye-bye, everyone.